Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today's review video is going to be one that might surprise some people. This is a plant that a lot of people don't necessarily know of. It's not a particularly rare plant, at least I don't think so anyway. Today I'm going to be talking about this beauty right here, which is the Discidia oyantha variegata. And I probably butchered that name, but essentially this beautiful Discidia here is the plant I'm going to be talking about. Now, for everybody that's come back, welcome! And as always, you know that there's going to be chapters at the bottom of this video. If you want to skip forward to some of the sections, please do. For the new people that have just joined, Nice to have you here. And just a bit of groundwork essentially before any of these videos, these opinions are obviously going to be biased to my experience with my specific plant in my specific conditions, which is in the UK and whatever that might mean. <laughs> and growing in my conditions, which is in a conservatory, which generally means good light levels, humidity is relatively high, and so on and so forth. But as always with all of these videos, I do encourage you, if you do have this plant, specifically as well this plant, because I don't think an awful lot of people do have this plant, do drop your experiences down below, because if anybody's considering getting this plant or they've come across it, I'd be quite surprised because it doesn't come up that often, at least around here, then definitely kind of share your experiences down below, because hopefully what this will be is something that people can look at and decide, yep, this plant is for me, and no, this plant isn't for me, or oh, actually, yeah, I want to try that plant specifically. But yeah, without further ado, let's go into the first topic. So background with this specific plant, and I will try to add a picture here of this plant when I first got it from my plant care app. So you can see what this plant looked like when I first got it. Granted, it has grown considerably. It's a relatively long Discidia. For the people that haven't necessarily owned Hoya or Discidia, they might be looking at this going, it's not particularly long. It takes a while to get to this with both the Hoyas and the Discidias as well. So a bit of background, let me put this plant down and we can keep chatting. So a bit of a background on that specific plant. And Discidias generally, for the people that are not necessarily aware out there, they are very closely related to Hoyas, I think, is it Dogsbane family of plants essentially, that they kind of belong to. So the same thing that if you've ever cut a Hoya stem, you might get that milky sap. The same thing will generally happen with a Discidias. A bit of interesting information about Discidias. It could be Dishidias, it could be Dischidias. I'm not entirely sure how it's pronounced necessarily, but with these plants, a lot of them, and do a quick Google search and you will see, they are very smartly adapted to their environment because a lot of them actually act as kind of a protector plant for things like ants. And by protecting the ants, they give them a shelter away from kind of the extreme weathers that they might be experiencing out in the wild or any other predators. And in return, what those ants do is they will protect that specific plant from pests, potentially. So it's kind of a bit of a symbiotic relationship. But the Skidias are a type of plant that is on the market. You do get it occasionally. There's a few kind of more common Discidias. I think the green version of this might be a bit more kind of commonly found, but you definitely don't see them as often as you might do kind of your average Hoya, even though, as I said, they're very closely related. And if I bring it up again, you'll see what I mean by that kind of similar type of morphology, because can you see this little tendril that's just kind of flying around all over the place, essentially? And you can see that it will wrap itself around something. Hopefully I've got a video clip that I've put over myself at the moment so you can see what this plant looked like before I took it down from the shelf, where it was actually wrapping and attaching itself onto something. But essentially they are closely related to Hoyas. They've got similar morphology. You do occasionally get them to bloom. I had got this one to bloom. I'm really hoping if I 
trawl through some of my old Instagram pictures, I might be able to find a picture of its blooms and I can add it so you can have a look at that. I'm pretty sure it was this Discidia and maybe, maybe it was on a different Discidia that unfortunately didn't survive. But this one's done quite well. For the eagle-eyed amongst you, you would have noticed that this specific plant when I got it had what <laughs> has fondly been called the collar of death at the moment with a lot of these plants where there's just a really densely compacted cocoa husk around the root and I think it's done mainly from a lot of the growers so we can root out. And this one does have it. I didn't remove it. I generally try not to remove it if it's on a Hoya type plant because there's not that many roots and they generally are only attached to that little area. Eventually they will grow into the growing media. This one has. And it's good if you can remove it because it could stifle the plant a bit. There's kind of mixed debate on whether or not it does. Um, I generally won't tend to remove it off my Hoyas or my Discidias purely because it will probably destroy the little root system that they have and potentially you might end up like knocking the plant back entirely or killing it. So I've left it in there. It hasn't caused this one any harm. Now the way that I this plant came to my care was actually from a local garden centre, it wasn't even a plant store. And I say this with a bit of trepidation because this isn't necessarily something that you will see in every garden centre or every plant store. Not because it's particularly rare, it's just not a plant that comes up very often. And I'll talk a bit more of that on the availability side of things. But yeah, I found it there. It was a decent price as well. Picked it up, not knowing an awful lot about this plant. I had had previous Tuskidias before and I was like, meh, I'll get it and see what happens. This is an interesting plant because I'm hoping there's other people like me out there where you get a plant and you're just like, I'll add it to the collection. I kind of like it. I've never maybe had this genus of plant or this specific type of plant before and I'll give it a try but you're kind of a bit lukewarm when you pick it up. That was this plant for me. And what did happen, and it does happen occasionally, I'm hoping it's not just me that this happens to, you slowly end up falling in love with a plant that you were a bit apathetic with in the beginning. And this is a plant that has got a very, very fond place in my heart at the moment. I don't know why it doesn't do anything particularly exciting, but it's just sheer tenacity with this plant. I'm just like, yeah, I like you. You can stay. <laughs> but yeah, that's a bit more about the background and how this plant came to me and a bit more about the skidias. Specifically, let's move into the next topic. So looking at speed of growth, and I did hint at the speed of growth that this plant has just a moment ago, but it is a relatively slow plant. It is obviously related to the Hoyas, and anybody who's got a Hoya will know that they tend to be slightly slower growing. Granted, when it does get much larger and more mature and there's more foliage with it, same as with Hoyas, it does tend to speed up a bit more, and it kind of makes sense because there's a lot more leaf there, there's a lot more green to photosynthesize and create energy for this plant. Um, I'll be interspersing different close-up shots of this plant throughout this video and you might be able to see on some of these shots that there is some black stippling on some of the green parts of the leaves. I'm not entirely sure what has caused this with this plant. It might be a bacterial thing, it might be a fungal thing, it might be um, something to do with fertilizing. It doesn't seem to be harming the plant. I was getting a bit worried about it because the leaves are very, very thin and generally the leaves of this plant tend to be a bit thicker. And since the summer's been here and it's been warm and it's been kind of going through its water at an alarming rate as well, it tends to have the thin leaves a lot more often now. In the winter, I find this plant, the leaves are a lot more succulent, they're a lot more plump. It doesn't seem to be struggling because it is growing new vines like crazy. So that's the thing I wanted to say here about speed of growth is in the winter, this plant pretty much slows down to do nothing. It, it just exists in the winter, at least it has done for me. In the summer is when you start getting explosive growth and you do get a lot more growth a lot faster and hopefully I'll be interspacing some videos throughout this and you might be able to see that it is a plant that does kind of kick into a higher gear in the summer. 
probably due to the higher light levels, the higher temperatures, the fact that it's kind of utilizing either through evaporation or through actually using the water on the plant, it's kind of going through its water quite quickly. You might be able to see, and I'll talk a bit more about accessories in a bit, this is in terracotta for a very good reason. But generally speaking, I would say, and I can show you, this specific tendril wasn't here two weeks ago at all. It didn't exist, even as a concept. So it does speed up considerably in the summer. and the winter, it's just a bit of a slow grower or doesn't really grow at all. But nonetheless, it is, it is a very, very interesting grower as well. The other thing that I will show, and hopefully I'll have some close-ups of this, you do get the all-white leaves and you do get the all-white stem. And I know with a lot of Hoyas, people get really worried and they just like chop it off at the beginning of that tendril or that stem because if you don't, it will sap energy from the rest of the plant and it could potentially kill your Hoya in that case. I have never found it with this plant. I do have a lot of white sections and what it will do is, and hopefully, let me see if I can turn it around so you might be able to see some of the crispier bits, it's the bits that nobody shows you on YouTube, but you know me, I like warts and all. Um, these crispier bits, granted some of them are connected to green bits, so I do need to potentially root those out, but a lot of these were also the old white stems. So that's absolutely fine. It will crisp up and kill those off so the rest of the plant can survive. But yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about speed of growth. Let's move on to the next topic. So ease of propagation with this plant. It is a relatively easy plant to propagate, kind of similar to Hoya. So if you've ever propagated a Hoya, very similar in that respect. I've had good success with this in both sphagnum moss and perlite or pond directly with a water reservoir and it's done quite well. I don't think I've ever attempted anything but those two methods with this plant. I am trying to see if I can bring you up so you might be able to see some of the, you can see some of the aerial roots on there. So you can see some of the aerial roots on there. I find that this is much more prolific with longer aerial roots than you would get with a lot of Hoyas. And I'm not generalizing because I know some Hoyas can get very substantial aerial roots. But yeah, this is one that if you use in a propagation bin, the way that I've kind of propagated this is in a propagation bin with LED grow lights on top, keep that humidity as high as possible, give it some decent light, especially because it's a variegated plant. If you have the all green one fair, you can probably pull back a bit on the light, but generally these plants, I find I used to have this in my previous location, I used to have this in bright, bright light. This was getting the same light levels as my cactuses and my succulents. So that gives you a bit of an idea. But yeah, relatively easy to, to propagate, slow. It's related to the Hoya. It's kind of the same speed as most Hoyas will propagate, but not particularly difficult one to propagate. And you can get it a lot more bushy and I'll show you the top because <laughs> this is definitely a plant that you could easily have on a shelf. Just make sure that it's attached because it can get quite forward heavy so it doesn't fall off the shelf, but it generally won't ever grow too, too bushy up at the top. So this is definitely something that you could have at the very top of a shelf whilst it trails down and it will be getting the light that way. And I've said this before with Vitara folium and I've got it right there basically, but plants that you can put on top of shelves where there's no downwards light anywhere near them and they get all their light coming from a front are kind of rare and far between. So it's good when we can actually find some, and this is a definitely a good candidate, basically. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about propagation. Let's move on to the next topic. So availability for this beautiful plant. And I did hearken about how I got this plant. I found it whilst just walking around my usual garden center around here. I can, and I will probably put a link down in the description below. It's very regional to my part of the UK. It's kind of a bit of a well hidden secret basically, because they will also get some rare plants for quite cheap. It's not very consistent and it is a bit hit and miss, but it is a great, great place. 
this definitely wasn't a rare plant for them. They can get those in as well. But occasionally, I think this came from a, a Dutch nursery. And it's the same thing that you get sometimes with these plants that are coming in from Dutch nurseries is you might get them in waves, at least in the UK and Europe, where certain times of the year you'll see them everywhere and then they'll disappear again. And you might see them again the next year around the same time. It's one of those, basically. But, uh, and I think this is around this time of the year where I got it two or three years ago. Hopefully that will be on the description of the video. Ah. Um, but yeah, I came across it. It wasn't particularly expensive. It was the same as something else that would have been the same size, either a Discidia or a Hoya. So it would have been kind of low to mid double digits, if that. And I think mid was too high that I'm saying here. It's probably kind of around the 20 or 30, I don't even want to say 40, I think 20 or 30 Great British Pound mark basically for this plant. There wasn't an awful lot of them. I don't think there's a huge demand. That's why you tend to get them in waves. I don't think the demand has changed. I don't think the prices have changed too much. It's kind of stayed relatively stable, but it isn't one that you come across very often at all, actually. So very, 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 very cool. So if you do potentially find one of these, I would say give it a try. It's not a particularly expensive plant and it's not a particularly difficult plant to keep happy. I will, and I've started to do this a lot more with these videos, I will give you a bit more about the care that I give for these plants in the accessories section. So moving on to pests with this plant, and I can happily report that I've not had very many pests on this plant at all, I would say at this point. Maybe maybe the occasional mealybug, and you would imagine this is the kind of plant that would lend itself to mealybug because it might have kind of nooks and crannies. Very similar to a Hoya again. Similar kind of pest pressures that you get. I don't think I've ever had spider mites on this. I don't think I've ever had thrips on this. Touch wood. <laughs> uh, I hear thrips at the moment in the summer and I start twitching and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that are doing the same. But uh, yeah, I think pretty much mealybugs are the only thing that I've ever had on this. And if I did, even with the amount of mealybugs that I've been dealing with recently in here, it wasn't one that got a heavy infestation at all. Kind of really, really manageable and got dealt with relatively quickly as well. So really not an awful lot of pest pressures, at least in my experience. As I said, you might be able to see those kind of dark marks on the leaves. Likely that could be a nutrition deficiency. It could be a bacterial or a viral infection. I don't think it is. I think that was a, an inconsistency with the water and it might be in some um, plant edema. So edema, I've kind of mentioned this on a couple of other videos. Edema is when a plant will suck up the water really, really quickly because it's been dry for too long. And there is a risk sometimes with some of the more succulent leaf hoyas that you would get this as well. And essentially what it does is it goes, oh, I didn't have water for a long time and sucks up all the water really quickly. That's fine, but sometimes it means that some of the cells, the, they burst essentially within the leaves and it could create a blister, it could create black marks like that as well. So just keep an eye on it. There isn't really any kind of solution for edema as far as I can tell. It's a lot more on prevention, so kind of more consist consistent watering and all of these things. But Generally speaking, not a plant that's particularly kind of challenged by pests. Moving on nicely to accessories with this plant. And you might be able to see, obviously, terracotta pot. You could have this as well in a net pot. I think I might have started this in a net pot because it's good for its soil to dry out entirely if possible. The reason why I moved this out of a net pot and learn from me so you don't have to do this is when it does get bigger, this is heavy. I mean, the, the pot itself is heavy and that's part of the reason why I want a terracotta pot. Not just because generally for most Discidias and Hoyas I will have them in a terracotta pot because it wicks out the moisture, but this also gives it a bit of counterbalance for how heavy this is leaning forward. It obviously depends on how you're going to be growing yours in your environment. You could have it trailing so it's not hanging off the cliff that is the, the side of the um, shelves. But that's how I want to grow it. So I need to do what I need to do to make it work in my situation. 
and um, usual aroid soil mix. Those are the only two big things that I would say. I have never grown this up, a support stick or a moss pole or even a plank. Plank might be an interesting one with this one, just based on what I'm seeing with its with the type of aerial roots that I'm seeing on it, it might attach. I have never grown it up something. So I'd be really curious if you do have this plant and you're growing it up a pole or up a stick or up a plank or anything like that, do share with everybody down below. I'd be really curious to see if this is a plant that does attach because a certain type of Discidia that's kind of disc shape and if I can find it when I'm editing, I'll put the name up here, looks a bit like a, a disc shape. That's also one of the main ones that kind of acts as a bit of a um, shelter for ants and it grows almost like a shingler up um, a tree bark basically. That one obviously will kind of attach quite happily but this one I don't know so let me know your experiences but other than that in terms of its care bright indirect light, bright light was fine for this as well. I let the soil dry out entirely. I've never grown this exclusively in pond. I've always had it in some form of a soil media and yeah let it dry out it gets fertilized same with a lot of the Hoyas and I don't know if people have clocked this yet on Hoyas I tend to treat my Hoyas in a very and this as well by default in a very similar way to how I treat my orchids which is that I fertilize them weekly weekly if that makes sense so weak fertilizer every week basically or every watering potentially and they seem to do really well. It means I get blooms a lot sooner than I would probably normally get. Um, but yeah, same thing with this one. Granted, I don't necessarily want this to bloom in it. If it has, it's probably only ever bloomed once. I'll see if I can find the images I said and hopefully I put it in at the earlier part of the video. But yeah, a really non-fussy plant. Moving on to final thoughts for this one and I will say I'll do my usual thing so knowing what I know now if I came across this plant and I didn't own it would I purchase this? Yes I definitely would. This is as I mentioned earlier on in the video this is a plant that surprised me. I kind of picked it up going it looks pretty I'm not sure if I'm gonna like it but I'm gonna give it a try and I really did kind of fall in love with it. It's a bit of a tenacious plant. It kind of just keeps on keeping on. And I have always said this on my videos. I am a huge fan of consistent plants. This is consistent. It's kind of on time and it does what it needs to do when it needs to do it without giving me too much fuss. More of those, please. I do love some of my more interesting looking kind of house plants, but some of them can be a bit dramatic at times. This is one that it, it it's kind of solid and it will just do what it needs to do. <laughs> now in terms of a score from zero being the worst or one being the worst, ten being the best, this wouldn't be a ten for me. I've got other plants that excite me far more than this one would do, but I would say it's a solid six, six or a seven maybe around there. And it's it's more to do with the fact that it doesn't kind of light my world on fire. I'm very fond of this plant, but that's the only reason. I mean, it's on par with most other Discidias and Hoyas in terms of speed. It doesn't generate any blooms, so if you're waiting for blooms, at least this one for me, I don't think, maybe that one time, but it's not going to be a heavy bloomer, and I think even if when the blooms were around, they weren't particularly impressive or fragrant, I don't think. So you wouldn't really be getting it for that. But generally speaking, if you just want a really solid house plant, but somewhere that's going to be quite bright and not have to worry about fussing it too much, this is the one, basically. I'm a bit of a helicopter plant parent, so others might excite me a bit more, even if they annoy me on occasion. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about this plant. Slightly different, not the kind of one that everybody would necessarily be aware of, but hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.